everyone. Thank you for uh, breaking with your lunch and coming in here to listen to our session, which is on uh, design, better living through design. I'm Deborah Udolf from Say Property, and I will just introduce the panel, and then uh, Russell is going to start with the presentation. So I've got Russell Pedley. You've got all our photos anyway, but um, Russell Pedley is director, um, a director at a sale. Uh, Michael Howard is managing director of Urban Bubble. Um, Ian Merrick, who's on the end, is Operations Manager for Essential Living, and Silvana Young is the Chief Design Officer for Get Living. So Russell is going to um, give a presentation, and then we're going to open it up for a sort of panel discussion and questions from the audience. So, Russell. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Um, good afternoon. Thank you. I'm finding this a bit intimidating, standing up here as the only uh, as a designer in front of these uh, operators. Um, I said to Ian last night that uh, I'm just here to be shot down, aren't I? And he said, no, 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 you're going to crash and burn. <laughs> <laughs> so the architects and the designers in the room, please back me up. <laughs> so what I, thought, what I thought I would do today is, um, is just, uh, in, in advance of our discussion in the moment, is just to talk about, if you like, uh, the exam question, which... Uh, that is the exam question we've been asked to uh, respond to. And I'm not going to talk about um, you know, the merits of good design in that sense. Uh, what I want to do is just mention, if you like, the three attributes what I consider to be good design and that we follow, and then talk about what it delivers briefly, uh, and then finish up a little bit about um, the integrated multi, um, uh, multidisciplinary approach to, uh, to design. Uh, so uh, dealing with the first part of design, Design, uh, for me, whenever I'm looking at things, is, is really the three key attributes. Um, uh, and it's relevant to the debate later, but does it work, will it last, and does it look good? Um, but that works at huge scales. Um, you know, works at city scale, works at um, a suburban scale, uh, putting together the streets and, uh, and courtyards, etc. Uh, but also equally, it works at the building scale, right down to how well that door handle works um, when you walk into the flat. So how, how it works is, is a very important uh, attribute to uh, good design. Um, and it's split into all sorts of other aspects, but clearly ergonomic design, the spatial arrangement, um, how the building, uh, how the uh, design works for, um, for people of all different shapes and sizes and impairments um, is absolutely critical. Um, the functional side of it, the systems in the building, uh, I'm sure we'll come on to waste chutes later, um, but you know how those work in a building, they've really got to work uh, exceptionally well, and also the apartment designs or the components that you're designing has got to work in the market. So um, this is some work we're doing with focus groups. The next bit, which I think these people are particularly interested in, is how long will that design last and maintain? Um, and I think that's an important aspect, you know, they're beautifully put together, but, you know, particularly in volumetric construction, how adaptable, how uh, um, uh, can those be modified in the future are really important things. Other aspects like uh, this is some amenity space we've done. You know, the leakage on um, uh, life cycle costing, I know from our office, we've got a pool table, we have to replace that uh, uh, blue bays every 18 months to two years. Uh, now, over the life cycle of this building, whatever the investment horizon is, how much is that costing? Uh, are people aware of that? So it's, it's important to understand all that data and the design and uh, flexibility issues going right into the beginning of the design process. And I'll come back to that more. So that all that data that we heard about earlier actually gets back to the designers. Um, and this is the one that uh, a lot of people, I think, always think is fairly subjective. Um, you know, does, does something look good? Uh, and to a certain degree, of course it does. But I also think that, um, you know, there are certain strategies that can be uh, deployed that actually provide some certainty. Clearly, analysing the site, the context, the historical uh, setting, um, and especially neighbourhood engagement are great ways of understanding the context of the site. Um, 
And so that design process needs to take that on board. Um, particularly, as I mentioned earlier, the idea of getting the data into, the, into, the, into that uh, design process, going through the optioneering to understand the different design, testing those out with all those people I just mentioned, um, and it, doing it early, not after you've got planning, um, where you can't make those changes. Get these people involved right up at the top and work all the way through. Once you get to red, do not change anything. Um, and then what can it deliver? Well, what can it deliver, of course, is uh, customer experience. And that is, that is uh, the, key, the key message, really. Um, and these, these, uh, the, this is our project uh, for LNG in Walthamstow. They're very complicated buildings because they are outward facing, facing to the public realm. Um, they have all sorts of different uses in the building, not just the build to rent, but the grocer shop, the baker, uh, the candlestick maker, I'm sure is there somewhere. Um, and, and also the private uh, amenities for the residents themselves. Um, there are lots of activities. Some people want to have a barbecue. Some be people want to have quiet contemplation. Some people want to exercise. Some people want to go swimming. All those systems, all those uh, processes need to be designed. And then you've got the added complications of uh, people coming into the building who are not residents and the security of, of those uh, issues. But it's not just the customers that we should be designing for, it's also for the operators and the managers because if they can produce a really good first class um, service, then obviously the customer experience is in, in heart. So that's like a, a double benefit for getting that right. The last area I want to just cover on, I touched a little bit on it earlier in the process, I mean, we as architects um, have sort of transformed our business in the last five years. Uh, we used to be purely architects, uh, but we realized, particularly in this sector, that you need to have much more multidisciplinary approach to design. Um, so we've set up completely different divisions within the practice, um, interior design, landscape design, and urban design to reflect some of those points that I made earlier. And dealing with interior design, you know, clearly absolutely important. It's made us better architects. We, you know, much more attention to detail uh, and to the delivery and certainly incorporating, uh, incorporating the client's brand management uh, brand standards uh, is important. And this, uh, you know, designing the apartments, by the way, this is a CGI. It's not real. It doesn't exist. I'll come back to that in a minute. Um, Amenities, this is it, Clippers. You know, it's designed to a budget, it has an industrial aesthetic. It's how it works that is what really matters, not how much you spend on it. Um, uh, some, some more shots here. Um, and, but, you know, design needs to work across all different kinds of um, budgets, the luxury end as, as well as the budget end. And then, of course, landscape design. External spaces are effectively, certainly in build to rent, in our view, uh, extensions of the interior design, uh, with the added complication of the natural environment constantly battering it. So it needs a lot of attention. Uh, and you need to create these spaces as if they're almost internal spaces, in, in our view, certainly the amenity areas, and design them so that there's places to dwell, places to congregate, et cetera, et cetera. And I couldn't think of any other area where you need to combine interior design, architects, um, and um, uh, uh, landscape architects and operators in, into the design of these rooftop amenities. Because there you've got everything all happening at once and it needs to work really well. Uh, and then finally, um, you need to test and, and verify these designs. Um, so we've set up a, a sale visuals, which actually allows us to really help that process. Um, whether that's inserting these designs into context to show how they will work um, um, in, in, uh, in their actual uh, environment uh, is important. It allows us to demonstrate that these are appropriate for that area. Whether, if someone could just dim the lights, sorry. <laughs> They're all a bit washed out, some of these, that's right. So, so this is uh, Finzel's Reach, uh, where you know, real important selling point is what's the, what's the amenity space like up at the top and what will be the view like. Really important to test these. And to test our sketches, architects love doing sketches. 
Uh, Sandy's down there doing one at the moment. Um, and we, we, but we need, before funds are committed to these very expensive designs, um, you've got to make sure they're damn well going to work. So this is where all this technology comes into it. You know, and use, use, using one of these, um, that visual that I showed you earlier, um, if any of you are interested, you can actually go and stand in that apartment and have a look around and see what it's like, um, really to satisfy. Um, and you can stand in this space and look at the double height space and really imagine it. And uh, this is all you need. It's not, it's not really that much technology involved. Um, and, and also how the inside spaces work to the outside spaces. This is another project we're working on. Um, is really important. And you can use this technology also to understand privacy um, as densities get higher, uh, creating places to retreat in urban centres becomes more and more challenging. It's even more important to make sure you've got those levels of privacy uh, and enjoyment and views um, uh, uh, nailed. Um, and again, uh, it's another project from me by Bo. You can actually, uh, we've got this outside. You can actually go and stand in that space and look around and see, see how it's working, how the heights of the buildings are working and so forth. So that's pretty much uh, all I've got to say um, on, on a massive subject and uh, look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Russell. Um, so when we had our sort of uh, call before uh, planning what we were going to say, what we discovered was we can either look at this in a really big picture way, which is sort of what you've done, or we, we, we as a group just get stuck into the detail, which is, um, I think, the temptation of the panel here. So hopefully we'll be able to balance the sort of big picture aspirational and then discuss uh, refuge shoots. So um, I'll kick off first with a question. Um, so if we can just ask... Um, who should inform, in your opinion, the design brief? Who should be in the room um, when a building is being designed? So, Ian, do you want to kick off? Personally, I think you have to make it totally inclusive. As Russell said, it is everybody. If I could have all my customers, then I, I feel, you know, you get buy-in. So, from the start, you have to come with that hat on that you understand everybody else's challenge. So it's no use myself as a, an operator moaning that the planning isn't going to work and that the design is wrong and I'd prefer it to be skewed left. Well, we bought it with maybe pre-planning permission. So sometimes there are restrictions and as you develop the plans for that product, to me, you've got to all understand where the limitations are. So it's no good me as the operator always moaning that that building actually needs to be 30 degrees further around so I could actually have better sunlight on this side. Or You have restrictions. Understand them, accept them, and then work as a team to make them come out the other end. Silvana, what's worked for you? I can add to that. I would say when, when you're saying be all inclusive, we're talking about the operator, but we're also talking about the maintenance. We're talking about the retailers. We're talking about the residents. We're, we're talking about everybody who is using that space, so you should be constantly gathering your knowledge on what's informing the design and feeding that in. Uh, I, nothing to add. I think we've seen a real step change. Most of our kits based in Manchester and Liverpool, and as I say to the team, we've got 8,000 mistakes to learn from because most of this kit was built up until about 2007, 2008. The best facility space we get is a lift lobby and a bin room. Now, you know, you look at some of this and I can't, nobody can't get excited with the sort of kit that's coming into the market for built to rent. It's extraordinary. And I think that comes down to operators going in with not just the operations hat, but with the customer hat as well, the resident. And that's, there's been a big step change. And that's not just on build to rent. We're now involved at uh, pre-planning and stage four as well with buy to open market uh, developers, Salboy, Capital Centric, Mulberry, Elite Group to a lesser degree, um, and getting involved and actually working with the architects to actually, you know, these guys have got to make sure their open market schemes stand up to the build to rent product. So I, I think, you know, nothing more to add apart from uh, absolutely getting the operator involved. What we can do more of is engaging with our customers on these early schemes that have come out to see what's worked and what hasn't. And I suppose that's a point for us. We're not doing enough of that at the moment. I think the biggest challenge we've got is if you think about the planning process, then the design process, then the build time, 
we could be talking a three or four year period. Just the experience you have with this market, we're only, what, six years old in this marketplace? What we thought on day one is 100% different from where we are now. How do you actually get your 8,000 lessons learned and build them into that process and make sure that the, we ha are actually benefiting from all of the mistakes we've made? Because we've all made them and we will continue to make them. But every single mistake costs you money. But you're also bridging the gap because we say that we're only four or five years old as, as build to rent, but you know, people have been managing buildings for many years. So we actually, when we reach a certain point in the design before we are prevented from making any changes, and we run the whole project through a design for management test, and we will be looking at everything to look at have we got the right welfare? Like, What size of security team are we likely to have in place? Have we got the right welfare for them? What's the facade like? What, is there changes that we can make by running it past through an absolute process to say, what will that do? How will that look long term? How will we manage it? And we make the tweaks at that point. And um, what can good design um, do to deliver operational efficiency? So how can it benefit? Um, wh how would you persuade I mean, an investor or a developer that spending time and money on um, delivering good design, whatever that means to you, can actually improve the operational efficiency? Who wants to? Do I? You can so I'm not going to talk about waste shoots, <laughs> but I am. I was in a consultancy meeting with a very large northern developer and they were nodding away saying, waste shoots, really, waste shoots? You're putting all your residents through the concierge area with bin bags. I mean, come on, guys. You know, five, six years in, and you're still not putting waste shoots in. So anyway, I'm not talking about waste shoots. <laughs> parcels. Um, I'll give you an example. You know, we've got parcel management, and I don't think anybody can future-proof parcel management. If you go to America and look at multifamily, they've never got a big enough parcel room. So we've looked at this to say, well, actually, what you find out is people want to not just receive, but also send back parcels. And actually, if we have a parcel room, and you've got a concierge or a front house or whatever you talk about, that's OPEX, that's money, to and from the parcel room. So actually, what we're looking at is actually, can we create a parcel management service on site, like a Doddle? Well, I think that there's, a, there's a company called Doddle. So actually, looking at that way, you actually have this added service for the residents where they can give <coughs> and receive parcels. It's secure, they'll always get the parcels at home. Um, and actually, you're not having to have a concierge or a front of house and building a lot of large, 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 large rooms. So um, that's one of those examples where the information that you guys know um, and you must know after a while how much parcel space you need mm -hmm. and stuff like that. It never gets into the early stage of the design. I told you last week. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but that's after we got planning and after is everything's been done. But yeah. Yeah. Russell, it's changed from two weeks well, ago. Well, keep up. We, <laughs> you, you have the collection cabinets that we can install in our buildings yeah. and you purchase X number of boxes. Then you go to the front desk and you say, how many parcels did you get today? Ah, oh, I got 75. How many boxes have you got? 35. What have you done with the other 35? I'll put them in the back. Yeah. Yeah. We cannot keep up it's, with it's what's happening in society, mm -hmm. let alone how we update our design, where we're going with drones and uh, <laughs> everything else. Have you already planned for the landing site outside each window? We've, we've, built, no, in, we've built in design resilience <laughs> to allow for that Hold adaption in the, yeah, <laughs> in the future. Yeah, because you're right, the service bay could be at the top of the building, not at the bottom of the building. That's why we're trying to <laughs> introduce lifts that do go to roof. Yes. If we've discovered we've got areas that can be used yeah, for that. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. But yeah. It, yeah, and we have the parcel boxes, a... and they have it where you can drop off as well as collect. So, mm -hmm. you know, so long as they're... Um, open source ones that, and there are various different providers who do that so you can have it in place I agree that mm. keeping it but when when you though even though actually uh, if you go into some of the doddle sites it's quite interesting their actual size of the areas they use are very very small because people pick up so quickly. Well we did some analysis we're using parcel management boxes and uh, tools and I was not convinced by them went to the elef elephant and castle scheme which is yeah, I get nice. limited <laughs> and we saw it and I was, I was absolutely brilliant I got it and it's something two and a half hours in student and five and a half hours in private resi the diff from uh, drop off yeah. to picking up. So actually, you know, a large scheme doesn't have to have this huge parcel uh, storage uh, area for these uh, automated systems. That's great. 
but do they work? And are they effective? So um, there's a place for everything. All I'm talking about, good parcel design. Uh, sorry, good, um, so you talked about good. Uh, how can it help operation? I think parcels is just one example, and there are different ways to do it. I don't think having a parcel room in the back for the front of the house has got longevity, and you can't future-proof this. I also think that at present, we're in this halfway house. Some of our residents want to actually be left alone. Some of our residents find that actually going to the front desk, talking to the staff, signing for their parcel. It's part of, yeah. it's part of that experience yeah. of being in the community. They might have been away from that building for 12 hours and spoken to only work colleagues. Mm -hmm. They go back and they suddenly find out there's a conversation about, oh, who, so and so's gone running. We forget that the most important thing is the building needs to create the community. Sometimes putting a barrier of not putting a parcel box actually might benefit our customers. Mm -hmm. It creates the reason that they go to the front desk. It creates the interaction. Suddenly they have to wait because somebody else is there. Oh, so they'll chat to them. At many times, in many buildings, and it's not just our own, you can watch this interaction taking place. People talk about a north-south divide, about going to the pub and people talking <laughs> to you. There is no north-south divide. We've just forgotten how to do it in the south. <laughs> Let's reintroduce it. Let's make it part of that... Like um, community spirit. Okay. So sometimes changing um, OPEX doesn't have to actually cost you money or save you money. It has to just benefit the customer. Okay. I think when, when we were talking, um, you all expressed a sort of frustration around um, uh, cost, uh, the challenge of encouraging uh, people to spend more money, developers spend more money on better quality um, fixtures and fittings and design in order to reduce either maintenance costs or life cycle costs. So how difficult is it for you and how much data do we have for you to be able to really present a strong argument, I mean we, we struggle with this a lot as well as a business, a strong argument to encourage the right design decisions, detailed design decisions to be made in order to future proof particularly life cycle costs, which are the sort of the elephant in the room that everyone's trying to sort of pretend is never going to happen. But how, how, do you, how do you encourage or how do you put a, a, an argument forward for not choosing um, the cheaper option all the time? I think at Get Living, we're in a fortunate position where we've got long-term investors and we're the operational side too. So when we can turn around to them and say, We've got the historic evidence from managing, sort of, you know, just shy of 3,000 homes now for about nigh on five years. We can turn around and we can say, that one pound part that you've put in all these different homes is costing us this amount of money because it's causing 80% of the, the callbacks, which is costing you whatever. So actually, you know, spend, I, make it a three pound part instead of a one pound part and you'll cut down in your operations. Can I put that in you context that. very simply? There are hinges out there that are put onto doors with a 25-year guarantee. There are value engineering situations where hinges are removed and dropped down to a five-year guarantee. What would you be doing if you were sitting there and you were actually worrying about your fire doors, as with Grenfell, for the sake of maybe two pounds? The difference, the products are out there mm. and the price differential is very small. But when people start looking at it, they oh, we've got 20,000 uh, hinges. So what? Mm. Over the long longevity, I've got five times the guarantee period. Mm. I don't have to spend any more money. And that's forgotten. Life cycle costing, I don't really believe we do it properly. We, we half-baked do it, and unfortunately, until <coughs> I can't do it myself, so until we can find a method of actually making that work, I think we will just keep making similar mistakes, but we need to make sure we communicate what we find out. Just one point to add, I think we're probably all lucky, uh, legal and general are our clients, and they don't do bad quality. And these are guys that own tens of billions of real estate. So they come with that cloud, they've got that long-term view. They're gonna hold this for 15 years plus. So there comes a completely different mindset to the developers of 10 years ago, where you know what to do. 
um, borrow, build, and bugger off. I think mm. was the phrase. <laughs> but and, and I think I, I think it's, it's it's again it's to be applauded. We have got this institutional mindset coming in with a long term hold, and so we are finding that you know quality isn't being compromised. It's not so much of this VE or value engineering. You know we are finding them decisions happening. But I think. Um, uh, yes, you can understand the logic of build, putting in a good capital cost on a component because it's going to last the period. But I've, I've been to a few uh, multifamily developments in, in the US and I've been to one scheme, I think it's called Park Lane in Boston. I went there over a, a three year period. And in that period, they had, I went the first time, it was all, uh, all the amenities was business orientated. It was next to the World Trade Center there. And there was all these workstations. It was all very serious and stuff like that. I went back the second time. It basically been turned into a sports bar. <laughs> okay. So within three years, four years, they had decided, right, that's the wrong thing. We want, we want to change it. Um, so, you know, they'd spent a fortune obviously anticipating that this business center effectively would last for years and years. But in reality, as you pointed out, the market changed. Yeah. Um, so sometimes you've got to, it's not an easy, uh, I guess what I'm saying, it can't be easy to work out what you should be spending at the capital because you might have to just constantly accept, right, every eight years we're going to refresh the entire um, amenity package. So we only actually needed to design it for, for eight years or whatever. I don't know. Yeah. No, I, I think that's, that's, that should be the case, you know, it should be agile. Our customers are changing at a quicker rate than they ever, ever have. And when I say customers, I mean residents who were once called tenants. They are changing at a really rapid rate. And, and you've, that, that's the one thing that institutional capital coming in will do. It'll b create that agility. And I, I think I, I spoke to a multifamily operator and they actually left quite a lot of the amenity space free and they leased up the building. And then they ran focus groups and they fitted out. Because you can guess, you do your analysis 12 months out, you look at the demographics, you can put in what you think's right. They waited. And they waited until they found out what their key uh, demographic and what their customers were, and they, re they fitted out what was, uh, what was right. Did they give a discount during that period? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the That's discount. That's a challenge. <laughs> and they'd never agree. Um, in respect to sort of design and, I mean, wellness is a, a big thing. So in respect of design and improving the quality of life of the the residents, um, are any of you um, doing anything specific around designing? There's an international well-being standard, I don't know if anyone else knows about that, um, but are any of your, are you or your clients um, designing to that standard and, and how important do you think that's going to be in the future in respect of um, the, what the customer gets out of good design? Massively. Um, absolutely, and certainly as cities become uh, higher density um, and, and so forth, it's important. Um, in fact, uh, I think we've got one of our um, uh, certifiers who's under training in the moment in the room. Uh, we've got two in our office, um, and we think it's absolutely fundamental um, uh, to get right. The whole point is you're trying to create places of retreat in a very difficult environment, and so you've got to. Um, really attack, if you like, uh, these things. And it's across the whole range. It's not just sustainability. It's about health and well-being and mindfulness, social value, and all this. And the, and the world standard, uh, I'm not an expert in it, um, but we will be, um, um, you know, covers a whole range of aspects. Uh, I think it's fundamental to the future of residential design anyway. And I think we've seen slides today about the key components of amenity space and welfare and facility, and that's great, and, and there's not much more we can add. But I do think social value is coming down the line and actually looking to challenge the designers on how we can create better social value in apartment schemes. And what I mean by that is 400 apartments in Manchester, say, might be 600 residents. That's, that's a plethora of skills. Yeah. And how can we create the space and can engage the people to actually create that community social value. In Manchester alone, they now weight land at 20% of social value. I believe that that they're one of the highest weightings at uh, local authorities. So I think it's not here yet. There's a few case studies being done by Bill Hughes at LNG and with some of the commercial stuff. But I think in residential, I think that's the next point, not sustainability or CSR, it's social value and actually understanding a commonality about what the social value mean. Is it soup kitchens, coffee clubs for the homeless? is it maybe all of the residents being able to support a charity and using their skills and the space to create that real impact in the community. It's also reducing their impact, coming back to shoots. <laughs> <laughs> being, being able to actually <coughs> separate out and recycle and put save from landfill, that is a positive that 
mm. most blocks of flats around the UK do not have. Mm. You know, the councils don't give the offer, oh, well, if you bring down a plastic bag, you put it on the street over there. They, they, they're not driving that. The customers are driving that yeah. now. Oh. And I think that's where they want to see us. They also want to see us produce our own energy, use our own energy, and actually not rip the hell out of the building every three years and replace it because that's wastage. Mm -hmm. okay. So uh, I slightly hear about the what you do with the design. I would say good design is flexible. So in other words, if your flooring's really good, your wall coverings are really good, changing the color of a wall can be instant if it's paint or wallpaper. So actually making, try not to put things like banquettes in, which are then fixed and can't be moved. Put in movable furniture. Let the residents play with it, as mm -hmm. you say. But, uh, you know, I'm going to uh, labour this point, you know, you need to be telling the designers what this, we want. <laughs> you know, at day one. Now, whether it's working, developing some kind of, you know, brand standard operational manual, I mean, I'm sure there's a number of architects in, in the room that, you know, how many times do we get given the operational manual to design to? Uh, I mean, we we, we, we do. Yeah, <laughs> but but, but, I, you know, but yeah. I think also the thing is, is that often these conferences are filled with people that are sort of, you know, the enlightened people, so to speak. And um, but sitting on the other side, sitting with architects, it 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 is also interesting that um, you know, have architects have to become more aware of not just for bill for rent, but for bill for sale operating costs and, and the challenges of delivering something that has an affordable either operational cost or service charge. I mean, is it something that, that architects are having to sort of embrace more? Um, because, uh, you know, it is becoming much, I mean, even, um, I mean, actually, interestingly, in Dublin, and it, when you make a planning application, you have to provide your operational costs at the point that you make your planning application. You have to, you have, to have understood what the building's going to cost to run at the point that you make the planning application. So it, is it incumbent on the architects to also sort of think about it yeah. in the design process? Absolutely, but don't pin it on all, always <laughs> on the architect, because no. I, this is about the point about... Um, you know, working together as a team. You guys are the experts. We, we're the, or, you know, the conductor orchestrating, you know, the structural engineers and all of that. Uh, that's our job, to design those spaces. But, you know, that's, that's my beef, really, is that... Uh... Well, can I, can, yeah, sorry. <laughs> but at Get Living, we actually say that we describe ourselves that what we do is we create brilliant big city neighbourhoods. And we don't talk about the building as a building, but we talk about the whole area. So every project we do has a whole load of public realm mm. that we include with it. So we'll say someone will, you'll sleep in your home, but you live in the neighbourhood. Mm -hmm. And we'll take the whole thing in. So we do, we do look at different, so we don't, we're not just looking at um, the... Uh, the, the, the different accreditations that you can have in terms of sustainability and, and mm. you know we've got the, the water filtration system in, in East Village which feeds the, the irrigation and puts the, the water into the school toilets so things like that so we we do all this type of stuff but also just last week actually I was just finding out before we started um, we've got things like cycle score where they rate mm -hmm. your area for that <clears throat> so we'll have ratings on that from <clears throat> a, a walk around visit that was done last week we also look at internet so you know, it's, it's a fact of life, it's what people are using and living on, but what we're doing is we're pushing ourselves to give the, the most robust and, and high levels of, of internet service we can have and rate ourselves on those, so there are accreditations for that. So I think we got it to the point where it was tested, you could download a film in five seconds. Mm. So if you can do that and offer that as part of your service, that's what people, you know, want. That's what people want. But Does we've anyone... got to share that. I mean, yeah, and yeah. one of the challenges is we've heard it today. We don't have a market at present. We don't have a presence. No. Are we built to rent? Are we multifamily? Are we PRS? I don't know. Well, we're still we don't have home. that customer base. <laughs> Therefore, there is, as far as a personal opinion is, that there is no competition amongst us. We've got to actually say, oh, we're going to use, I can't remember what it's called, it's the world Wi Fi, and they give you platinum and Wide school. Uh, yes. Ian, Ian you're learning. Uh, you, 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 I know because we've, we've worked together, you're designing schemes, operating them, so you've got the perfect opportunity to get that cycle of you know, uh, data back into the design process. Get Living, you inherited 
um, uh, uh, an athlete's village, mm -hmm. which wasn't designed for build to rent and obviously had to adapt it. But what I'm particularly interested in is, um, is you then went off and commissioned a purpose designed uh, community. Um, you know, what kind of things, sorry, I just dying to Take ask this question. From the you know, no, yeah. I'm really interested and I'm sure That's these are, what things did you learn in that process? <laughs> Um, we learned huge and we're still learning. So we, we work very closely with all the teams that are doing the maintenance, doing the security, doing just the, the, I'm working with the residents too to, to pick up on learnings. Um, every project that we start, that we now work on, we, we start it with an immersion day and we will bring the entire design team, the architects, the engineers, the structures, the PMs, the landscape, and we will walk around our buildings. We'll walk around East Village, we walk around Elephant and Castle, we walk around anywhere where we're operating and we will say, that is great, that is really not so great. <laughs> let's design more of these, let's try and design well, it. that's and, music and it's, to my ears. It's, it's, it works really well because also we challenge the whole design team and we'll say, yes, there's a whole load of tick box compliance you need to, you need to meet, but don't use it as a chat box. Use it as a challenge to say, OK, now that you get an understanding of who we are, what we're trying to deliver, mm -hmm. that you can understand why we are questioning some of the things when we're having our you know, fortnightly CDRMs or the progress meetings and we're saying, but have you thought about it? You'll understand where we're coming from if right on day one we've taken you and shown you where, where, our, where our key drivers are. One of the challenges I have is when it's put into interior design and you have an interior design. You had one of the pictures up there of a corridor with the, similar to these lights. I know the, the make, model, and life cycle, and costs of operating it. It's an 89 watt ceiling corridor light. It runs off a of DALI, goes down to 10%, so that's 8.9 watts per hour, per day, 365 days. Cost me 1,500 quid. Waste of money. <laughs> That is the level of detail we need everybody to get to, but it's boring. <laughs> looks nice. Yes. It looks good, though. But there are equivalents <laughs> that look... It's, it's going back to that manufacturer and saying, don't give me 89, give me 28. It's a fourfold saving on your energy consumption, which is Very what your customer yeah. is wanting in the env environmental contribution in that building. Mm. So it is linking all of that. We all want things to look beautiful. I don't want to poo-poo that. I, we don't want to go to Stalag 10 every single time we go to a building. And there are situations like that. Yeah. We, we actually need to... You look at a corridor, you look at the lighting, you look at the flooring, you look at the outside of the building. How do I clean it? Mm -hmm. If the only way I can get to it is by trapezing across uh, another building, it's not good design. No. It comes back to your principles where you started. Mm. Has anyone got any questions? Just one quick one. It comes back to your point about learning. But Silvana said Chris, it earlier. I'm just worried. I'm just concerned that we're still too insular, that we are looking at this far too totally in isolation. Silvana summed it up earlier. There's people been managing buildings for years and years and years. I don't think enough lesson has been learned, especially when you talk about well-being from the commercial industry. Um, the, the serviced office industry has been around for donkey's years, although we, we, we work have reinvented it co-working. And I don't think any of those lessons are being brought in to this market sector to learn because it is a mass populated area where a lot of people live and they all live in communities, whether it's a commercial office, whether it's a serviced office, whether it's a hotel or whether it's residential. From a design perspective, you've got loads of things to go back on. Do you think we are too insular still? Um, well, a point of what I was saying is I do feel there's a bit of that going on, uh, but it's a, it's a process. You know, I understand that you've, you've got to, you know, the projects get developed in stages. They get invested, you get planning permission, and then suddenly the whole development's sold to somebody else. So those are situations where there isn't that continuity. Um, and, and so there is a bit of insulation going on between the process um, um, in BIM, design, you know, building information modelling does allow for those things you learnt at the early stages of the design to be carried through to the different stages. But no, I, 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 I think certainly we just heard an example, a good example, um, which I think should be endorsed much more. I think it's easier to achieve, though, when you're a younger company and you're creating, because our, our company, we've got people from hotel industry, people from student background industry, we've got 
people have done commercial property, residential property, and between us, we work as a team to make sure that we're picking up the right learnings. And I just, can I just add to that? I think um, we are learning. It's, it's, this is exciting. We're building, it's not new. We've been renting homes for years and apartments, but it's nice to create something new as well. And I think, you know, you look at the likes of legal and general, 25 billion quid's worth of assets under stock. There's a lot of learnings coming from there. But let me just thought, we've all gone to America, we've all looked at the mature markets. We have the UKA where we're holding 18 round tables a year, where we're collaborating anecdotally, but we'd like to get some more KPIs. But anecdotally, sharing some lessons. So there is a real collaboration in this industry. And if you don't see it, get involved in the UKA, because that, that's where it's happening. Pun, <laughs> David Butler would be happy. Yeah. Last, point, <laughs> last point, but I will challenge. Legal and general have learned a lot from build to rent. They go around city saying we own this, own this, own this, and we've got, but they don't know the occupiers. And yet build to rent has shown how that mm, relationship with the customer, the resident is vital. And we work, as you just mentioned, service officers are proving it. So actually I think there's a lot that we're doing that the other real estate uh, sections are, are learning from us. We still do, uh, I've got an example, tomorrow, we're taking one of our development team to a building that was constructed 12, 14 years ago but actually put all of the uh, SPV access points in a certain direction, in a certain place, in every single apartment that is known. It's clever design that means that maintenance is easy. We're, we're finding, or I've come across situations where you open up a wall and the eye access is against the other rear wall which is a solid concrete beam huh common sense tells you it should be the other way around but it gets built in that way so i think we have we have a lot of lessons to also learn about who's checking the quality from an operations point of view i don't think we feed back enough of when it goes wrong prime examples you know the number of times you find that under the sink cables uh, pipe work is not fixed and you go, oh, well, it doesn't matter. Yes, it does. Because movement allows water, allows a leak, it's damage, it's lost money, it's lost rent. The one statistics that sits in my brain every time I actually work, if I can put one pound on my operating profit, it's worth 30 pounds in value. So not spending a pound makes me 30 pounds richer. So if you ask that, Every time you decide, we're going to change this carpet, why? Oh, it's got a stain on it. Well, if it was carpet tiles, could I change three tiles for £15 or this whole carpet for £1,500? Multiply, by, multiply it by 30 and then ask the same question. Which choice would you have made in the first? A carpet or carpet tiles? That's a very simplistic way of looking at it, but I think that's the level of detail that we need people to go to and unfortunately, detail's boring, but that's what the teamwork is about. Exactly. Does anyone have any questions? Gentlemen there. So it's actually two questions. The first one, what is the mechanism of engaging the customer in the early stage while preparing the development brief? The second one, what is the criteria of selecting the amenities for any specific uh, built to rent uh, development? any indoor gym, outdoor gym, swimming pool. So what is the, the criteria of selecting the best amenity we have to provide for a specific project? Do you want to go first? Um, OK. Um, how do we engage a customer? Focus groups, I think uh, Get Living have just provided a great example of how that works. Uh, we don't do enough of it. We've learned from what we have and the stock we have. Talking directly to the customers, we haven't done enough of it. We've only got one scheme, but we launched another six this year. So I think that's going to be part of that uh, maturity and as we grow as a business. In terms of what amenity mix we pick, um, that really is... Um, Another, again, learning about what's in the actual area. So when we look at where we're going to invest or a build to rent scheme or, or a residential scheme is going to be, it's looking at what the competition proves. It's looking at what rents we can achieve, looking at what the customers in that area may want. As a, you know, it's, it's got to be 24-7 service or not. And also looking at what's, what, what's the difference. How, you know, two things I always stand by is how does a property stand out and stand up for something? Because in, the end, in Manchester, we're a very busy city. We've got eight build to rent schemes on one road. So how does one differentiate from the other? So that, that's part of the analysis that goes in uh, very early days. But probably from an architect's point of view, it happens much, 
much further down. Yeah, well, obviously we get set a brief. Um, uh, I mean, in answer to some of your question, you know, it's also, and actually, Savannah, you touched on it about looking out side of the site and the development and what's available and then basically deciding okay so if there is good gym facilities maybe we don't need to provide a gym or or whatever it may be it's actually using back to what i was talking about contextual analysis understanding what's going on around the site will inform what you you need to do that will attract residents to that new community mm -hmm. uh, and 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 also make sure it's not a gated community as well make sure it's open to the public realm the only addition I'd add to that is when you get amenity, so somebody puts a cinema in, unless you actually activate it, yeah. <laughs> it's a box. It's of no use. So it's, it's paramount that you actually have three, four, five uses for that area. So a gym is a perfect example. A gym can actually work for static equipment, it can work for yoga, mm -hmm. it could work for dance classes, it can work for private parties. But you need to make sure that you've planned all four of those mm -hmm. where the equipment goes when you're having a party. How do we interact it? Is it in the right place for movement of the floor because there's a lounge underneath it, which is a private library and it's got to be quiet? You know, you, you have to interrogate it in such detail that you actually go, right, I've got four options. If the first one fails, I'll go to the second. If the second one fails, the third, fourth. And by the time you've got to the fourth, you'll have four more below that to get going. Oh, could it be a golf range? Yeah. So can I have a cinema that has uh, interactive golf? Can I actually make this work? You, you have to know, one, your customer, two, your area and demographics, and three, how can I keep it as flexible as possible? So I'll add to that, I'll say that there's three key things that you, you always really want to be providing for your, your residents, which are a local convenience store, so it, is there one near you, or if, if you've got a retail unit, are you the one who's going to be able to provide that? Somewhere where they can, a, a gym, so again, is that nearby something they can use, or is that something you need to be providing? And then, where can they meet? Because we all know the average that if you know more than one person who lives in the block where you are, then you're more like the percentage you're more likely to stay. So, and you, you people want to have an interactive space. Now that can be a cafe. It can be it can be anything. It can be a, a you know some kind of bar. It can be just a, a, a co-working space. However you want to define that. But they need somewhere where people can socialise together. So you either do that in house or there is somewhere nearby. And actually, in terms of the service offering for the amenity space, the way that we're looking at going forward is when you can justify it, when you've got the right um, scale of, of, of project, actually partner with somebody else who does it really well. Mm. So lease it out to somebody who can provide the services that you want to be providing. But you know, I'm not a, I'm, we're, we're in it for creating the right environment for people to live in a really great way. But I'm actually not the most up to date on what all the different offerings are that people want. There are other people who do do that, so I'd rather partner with them and let them run it. Companies like So Far Sound, it's, it's a company that just says, if you've got a venue, we'll do a concert. Great. Three times at Vantage Point, we've actually had them on site. It is total strangers coming to our building. We are getting the community involved, mm. listening to Darren before and saying, oh, you're insular. Oh, not really. <laughs> we want to actually have that engagement. We just have to think about how we're going to do it. So again, it, it, to me, all of these areas, you just have to put a little bit more effort in and, and be creative, but make sure the whole team yeah. have been involved in that discussion. And the focus groups I've come back to is the most important. Talk to your customer. Okay. There's a question over there. Yeah, um, I've heard a lot about the internal amenity spaces and the importance of it, but I guess it would be good to understand what val value you place on external amenity and how you kind of safeguard that through the kind of construction from value engineering. Russell? <laughs> <laughs> when you say external uh, amenities, you mean, mean grounds? So, so it's roof terraces, I, 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 it's yeah, the I, podium guard. I hope that wasn't directed at me, Donald. No, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> I, I work with Russell, so the question's not really for Russell. It's, okay. more, it's more so for you guys. Um, I find it absolutely um, 
I find it absolutely paramount, especially in Manchester, because uh, we have got no gardens or parks or outside space. It's terrible. Uh, it doesn't always have to be the rooftop. Uh, Salboy are launching their scheme in June. Uh, we'll go on site next week to launch up, and we've got an acre garden in the middle. And we've bought, we can't have any gas in the, in the grounds, and we wanted barbecue pits and fire pits so people could sit around in autumn and have a glass of wine and encourage, facilitate space. No gas. Um, so we've bought a bought a large catering van that will be permanently there so we can have uh, barbecues and hold events. Yeah, facilitating well the space. Well done. Uh, thank you. Um, but, thank you. Um, but we've also, uh, one of our other clients, DTZI, uh, Anco and Co by Mulberry, 143 homes uh, for rent launching in September. And they've spent some like three million quid extra on amenity. It's, it's ready for like a 500 unit building. But what we've done and, and, and what they wanted to do is have the outside space on the rooftop and that, that community space so we can encourage the outside community to come in. So on the top, on the rooftop, we've got a private area that you can rent out as a dining area lounge, but it's big enough where we can bring in the likes of Seven Brothers Brewery, uh, Via Chat, Kettlebell, uh, Tast, all of the local F&B operators. And I think there's a big veganism thing going on in Manchester. You guys in London have probably been doing it for a decade, but it's only just caught so I don't know. <laughs> and um, so actually bringing in the local vegan restaurant to come and show us how to cook, you know, good vegan food. And, and so we've created a space upstairs which can be used to bring in operators with a captive audience and it can be rented out private, uh, but also on the flip side, it can, it's a public space that can be used upstairs, so it's separate. So if something's happening privately, we can still use the space for yoga or to chill out or, or just to read a book. So I think for me, um, I only want to work with clients to share our vision, which is making great spaces. Uh, and we're very lucky to do that and have uh, uh, clients that share the same values and vision. So I was just going to ask a related question, because this is one of my bugbears. So what advice, I, I mean, outside space is obviously really important and, um, and, and public realm space as well, not private space. But um, one of the things that we struggle with is um, encouraging our clients to think about warranties and maintenance contracts at the time that you procure the construction contract, because um, notoriously, somehow trees um, and plants have the ability to die as soon as the warranty period has expired, and then it costs a lot of money to replace them. So what advice would you give um, in respect of uh, how early should you be thinking about things like warranties and maintenance contracts and defect management arrangements, um, and, and how much influence do you find you get um, encouraging uh, the, uh, uh, the, the powers that be who are negotiating, because it all adds money to the construction cost in the end, to, to think of it more, more in, in the round as opposed to looking at the, the construction price. And, and how do you manage that, that, things like design and build as well? It, it's, a, it's a difficult one. Yeah. It's a difficult one because you pass it over to the contractor to build out, but actually the relationship has to be with the operator because we have to be the ones that are replacing it. So it's fantastic that they can get, you know, they can purchase whatever quantity of, of product for that project, but actually what happens in two years, five years, 10 years, that, that's the part that's so, we haven't perfected it yet. I haven't got the answer yet, but we are definitely working on trying to create the right way to procure that takes into account the operational side for long-term management and, and how that relationship sits. I think one of the things, and I shouldn't mention companies, so I won't, but an item like a lift, you know it's there for 40 years. It comes with a, a reasonable guarantee and they'll give you a really good price on capital. The challenge you get, you say, what's the maintenance cost? Oh, well, it should be something like this. You actually come to it and it's a third higher. If you went away from that contractor to another contractor, one year after the warranty's finished, you'll find you're at least 40% less. Mm -hmm. However, you are sometimes, we've experienced this, we were tied into a contract for so many lifts for so many buildings. Mm -hmm. uh, and that to me is really challenging. So we would all like it, back to the idea of the hinges. It doesn't sound like much, <laughs> but it makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Wi-Fi, the one item within the building. I couldn't believe that my contractor would allow that our wiring in a building does not come with a longer than two year guarantee. 
<laughs> Every building comes with 25 years guarantee now of that wiring. I don't need to even pick up the phone. It doesn't, has no cost implications for me for 25 years. So there's the advantage. Uh, but you've got to do it. And we've got to understand, is that item going to have a life cycle of 25 years? Yeah. But I'm afraid items, we're sorry. going to have to wrap okay. up because oh, I think everyone else is going back in. So <laughs> I'm really sorry, but I think we've run out of time. Um, so come and ask questions afterwards so we won't rush back in the other room, but otherwise I'm going to get my hand slapped. So um, <laughs> I would just like to say thank you all very much for choosing this session. Um, there's lots of people here. I hope you found it interesting. And yeah, if you've got any questions, then come and um, ask us at the end of the session. Thank you. Thank you.